so this is on tape. I told you at the beginning of class last time, we're not going to go digging into the textbook looking for things that we haven't talked about in class. We're just not. Everything that is on the test is going to be something that we've covered in class. So you have all the PowerPoints, you have all of the information in class. The purpose of a, of a review session is for you to come and get clarification about the things that you're unsure of, of the things that we've covered in class. We're not in a, in a review session going to just stand up there and re-deliver the first three weeks of material to you. That's pointless. We've already done that. We've, we've been through that. However, if you want to study between now and Friday for the test on Monday, so that you come in on Friday with a set of questions about the things that you don't understand, or the things that are unclear to you, or the things that you may have conflicts when you look at other people's notes and things like that, I, I, we would be happy to do that. I mean, I, I did this with my ecology of food students this morning. I basically wrote a study guide for them on the test, and it was just a list of the two major topics we've covered and subsets of those major topics. And they looked at it and they're like, that's pointless, that's just what we've talked about the last three weeks. I'm like, yeah, because that's what's gonna be on the test. So if you prepare for Friday and come in on Friday with questions, the fact of the matter is you can do this every day in reality. Review Monday's notes in preparation for today. You can come in today and ask questions over Monday's notes. We can do that before the, the test and do a review session that way. And I'll stick around until you've exhausted all the questions that you have. The one question that I won't entertain is what's gonna be on the test? I'm like, well, it could be anything in the last three weeks that we've talked about in class. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for it, but come with questions. If you guys come and you don't have questions, then we're kind of dead in the water. So we need, we need to know what you don't understand so that we can help you understand it. In order for that to happen, you have to have prepared for the, for the review session. Dr. Judd and I don't have to prepare for the review session because presumably we have stuff in our heads, all of the things that we'll talk to you about over the last three weeks. The other thing about review sessions in this class that people oftentimes find disorienting is seldom during the review session do Dr. Judd and I, well, we've done this before, seldom do we give you the answer. We formulate a question that we throw back on you to get somebody else in the room to come up with the answer or to lead you to the answer that you're seeking. Because that's the other thing about being on a test is when you don't know the answer to something, if you can ask yourself a set of questions that will lead you to the answer, sometimes you can recall things that you didn't think you could by interrogating the question that's on the test as well. And so come with questions. We will probably answer many of your questions without answering your questions, but you will eventually get answers to those questions. And if you can't make a Friday evening, if that's what we schedule, don't forget we have office hours. Yeah, come see us during our office hours. Every morning the rest of the week at nine and, and carve out time outside of that. And if it doesn't work for you during our office hours, just make an appointment with us. Uh, what time on Friday? Seven. Seven work for you, Dr. Joe? Yeah. What about the rest of you? PM. They were talking Friday night. Here? Maybe we've done it in the downstairs in the past. Let's do it in G32 because I have a key to that yeah, room. So yes, it's, if it's locked, we can get in. G32 in white science, ground floor at the end of the hall on the left. G32. Yes, we can certainly record that. We've also done that before for review yeah. sessions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can totally do that. Okay, so while you're putting that in your calendar, um, if you looked over the example literature summary that uh, is posted on Google now, you'll notice that the summary and introduction portion of that final product is rather short. So what we want to do today is finish talking about the introduction, make sure you understand it, make sure we can clarify any things, any parts of it that maybe you don't fully understand yet. And that way, if you feel like you've got a real good grasp on the introduction, you shouldn't have too much trouble editing it down, revising it until you've got a few sentences at the beginning of your, at the beginning of your literature summary. So to just sort of recap to where we got last time, um, you know, did a really nice job in the, in the three lists of identifying 
the big question that the authors used to frame the opening of the, of the paper, do humans influence diversification? And we also heard that one thing that we know is, well, if there's a species being generated and humans cause extinction, that changes the pace of their diversification. So we know humans can cause extinction, and that can relate to the process of, of diversification, speciation. We ended here. What's the unknown that this paper is going to attempt to tackle, which is can human activity interrupt diversification? We have incipient speciation that would otherwise lead to, to new species. Can humans interrupt that process? So now we got to go to what is this paper about specifically? And then we'll talk about how well the introduction um, gets you prepared for, for this. So I'm going to start non-arbitrarily with Elizabeth. Can you tell us what this paper is about specifically? Uh, it's about the so like how human interaction can affect the adaptive radiation in galapagos finches. So we've got the galapagos finches. Remember what specifically about the Galapagos finches? Peak size and shape. Peak size and shape. Okay, so Galapagos finches beak. So someone else help me uh, unpack this a little bit further. What about the beak shape? Yeah. So like they were saying that uh, human interaction can uh, affect the sizes and the shapes. So like some of them can be more. Some of them can be larger. Some of them. Can they describe very different types. Yeah, different kinds, right? Larger and smaller beaks. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So that's what we're going to do beak size. <laughs> and then it can be. Oh, sorry. Someone else? Um, yeah. Basically, that each beak size has a specific job to do for specific seeds or specific resources. So we'll come. We'll Come to this specialization concept um, momentarily, because that's really good. What about the um, what was the pattern in beak size that they observed in GX5 and 4S? Yeah. They uh, they saw a divergence in beak size in this species, yeah. where one section of the population was getting larger beaks and one was getting smaller. Good. They saw a divergence in beak size. Does anyone know what the name of that, the shape of that distribution of divergence is? Yeah. Bimodal. Bimodal, right? So the Galapagos finch's beak size shows a bimodal distribution. And did you get a sense of how this bimodal distribution relates back to humans influencing diversification? Yeah. Well, how does this question of what happened to the bimodal distribution in beak sizes relate to the big question of do humans influence species diversification? Yeah. So it would be like if the bimodal distribution goes away once humans are brought in, did it show that it's changed? Yes. So the, the, this paper specifically, you're right on it, is did human, does human influence affect the bimodal distribution? Did humans change the bimodal distribution to a unimodal, eliminating that incipient divergence? change that bimodal beak size distribution in Galapagos finches. Okay, so let's um, take another step back. Um, well, what process is this beak size related to? You guys were getting into that already when it came to, um, to herbivory. So when it came to beak um, specialization, what ecological process is, the, is beak size relevant to? You had to think about this in terms of your own concept maps. What ecological process is beak size relative to the finches? Predation. 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 
nutrients, energy. So we're talking about um, we're talking about eating, right? So in the case of eating plants, we often call it herbivory. But you often hear people talk about seed predation because when you eat a seed, you're effectively eating the whole plant. And the difference between herbivory and predation is that when you're an herbivore, you eat some leaves, some shoots, some roots. You don't kill the whole individual. When you're a predator and you catch a gazelle, that's it for the gazelle. Right? So we sometimes talk about herbivory, which affects seeds as seed predation. So the connection here is herbivory, and the reason is um, different birds specialize <coughs> different seed types, as we talked about, as we mentioned before. So they framed this in the context of an adaptive radiation of Galapagos finches. Um, why did they do that? This is all about one population of finches that seems to have two divergent specialized subpopulations. They were completely in a brief that they eat bigger and smaller seeds. Why did they frame this in the context of an adaptive radiation in general? The finches. So you start out with one colonizing finch from South America. Darwin inferred that colonization, and, then, and now we have many species of finches. One of them is just by the fort, and the other two species they talked about. Can we catch those? Polygenosa? Yeah, Polygenosa and Magna rostris, big beak. Um, these are, now we've got three of many Galapagos Island finches that are derived from likely one common ancestor. That going from one to many species in a relatively short amount of time doesn't mean when we talk about a radiation. So, like, um, obviously, the resources are different in certain places, and they also change over time. So, the fishes have to adapt to the changing resources. Right. That's the idea of the adaptive radiation. And what features um, do, we, did they fo do we focus in on generally when we think about? So they go on and on about this adaptive radiation, and um, I think it's sort of odd that the whole paper is about Geospiza fortis, but the first species they mention is Geospiza foliginosa. Um, but they talk about the beak size of those two other species as evidence that divergences in beak size within a population may lead to radiations where different species have different beaks specialized for different foods. So they go on and on about this adaptive radiation to sort of justify an assumption here. And the assumption is that this bimodal distribution in beak size has anything at all to do with diversification. They could have measured the distribution of tail size, and maybe tail size doesn't have anything to do with adaptation to the different precipitation regimes and, and food requirements of the finches, but they picked beak size because there's evidence, sort of contextual evidence, among all the other finches that diversify the Galapagos Islands, that beak size has something to do with, with specialization on different foods and eventually diversification in the generation of new species. So, with that point, I want to ask you all for some feedback here. What did you find helpful about this introduction? What parts sort of clicked for you, helped you understand what's going on? And you can think specifically back to when you.